In this, the third and final part of Peterson's Rule 6, Set Your House in Perfect Order Before You Criticize the World, let me finally share with you the hot take messages I got from this rule. Peterson essentially justifies the black pill ideology. If you find yourself in a bad situation, take the blame for it to make it better. If you are in a bad situation or something bad happens to you, it's probably your fault. And finally, in the life lesson section, don't do things you know to be wrong, don't think too hard, and don't try to improve your culture or your government until your own life is in perfect order. Plus, there's a whole lot of Jung and biblical stuff sprinkled throughout the rest of this chapter, which is probably the best seasoning we could hope for at this point. Welcome back. Let's finish up this rule today so we can move on to other fun things like psychiatry. That is going to be sunshine and rainbows compared to this rule and the next rule, what I've read of it, and probably the rest of the rules and the next book. Obligatory YouTube info dump. Like at the end of the video if you enjoyed this content. Subscribe for more purple haired edutainment stuff. You can hit me up in the comments, on Twitter, on Discord. You can support the channel on Patreon. There's duck pictures, like cute duck pictures, and live streams. Those are things that are happening now. Join today! So, part one, we started the thread of the angry downward spiral. Part two, we kind of continued that thread, circled the drain a little bit, and hopefully walked away with the message that Life's awfulness didn't have to be met with more awfulness. So in these final two sections, we're going to follow this thread and see where it goes. See what the life message we're supposed to take away from this is. Before that, remember that this setup is for the book and Peterson and all of that. This is for my response to the Petersonisms. And this is for related research or science brought in by me in this particular video's case. I get that coming up with interesting titles for stuff is hard. I am facing down that challenge on a weekly basis now. But if you're going to reference a well-known poem slash book, at least mention it while you're using it. The section title here lines up with a book by the Nigerian author Chinua Achebe. Unlike Faust, this book was part of my high school's curriculum. That book's title itself is apparently a reference to a line from Yeats's poem, The Second Coming. Hmm. Given that the book is dealing with restrictive gender roles and the negative impact of colonialism and Christianity on a group, I'm going to guess that Peterson is intending this as a Yeats reference. Anyways, the opening paragraph for this section in its entirety so I don't misquote something. Whole peoples have adamantly refused to judge reality, to criticize being, to blame God. It's interesting to consider the Old Testament Hebrews in this regard. Their travails followed a consistent pattern. The stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and the Tower of Babel are truly ancient. Their origins vanish into the mysteries of time. It's not until after the flood story in Genesis that something like history, as we understand it, truly starts. It starts with Abraham. Abraham's descendants became the Hebrew people of the Old Testament also known as the Hebrew Bible. They enter a covenant with Yahweh, with God, and begin their truly recognizably historical adventures. Uh, so the origins of these stories vanish into time because it started off as an oral tradition before being written down at some point. Not a huge mystery on that front. And plenty of cultures have stories of we started at the top, now we hear, falls from grace, or stories where huge chunks of the population are killed off in some sort of catastrophe. And no, I'm not saying this is due to the Jungian collective unconscious or anything like that. Just that we've tended to want to explore certain environmental features or happenings in story form. I had to check with someone who's more knowledgeable than me in this stuff to make sure I wasn't going to fudge it even worse than Peterson. By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Apologia. 
Granted, Peterson couched this a little with the something like history comment, but the Old Testament, especially the Old Testament, is not a historical text. Recognizably historical is so vague that it may as well be meaningless, and I suspect that this is a hedge again to be relevant to the religious and non-religious alike. To the non-religious, this can read like a sarcastic little jab at how some people take the Bible's literal truth. And for the religious, I could see this being read as an acknowledgement of the Bible as a historical text. I'm going to put most of the next paragraph on the screen for those of you who are more familiar with the Bible than me, and that isn't hard to do. I'd be interested to know the general take on if this is a fair abstraction of how Bible stories tend to go, especially Old Testament, or if it's kind of speaking to you as more one story in particular. Under the leadership of a great man, the Hebrews organized themselves into a society and then an empire. As their fortunes rise, success breeds pride and arrogance. Corruption raises its ugly head. The increasingly hubristic state becomes obsessed with power, begins to forget its duty to the widows and orphans, and deviates from its age-old agreement with God. A prophet arises. He brazenly and publicly reviles the authoritarian king and faithless country for their failures before God. An act of blind courage, telling them of the terrible judgment to come. When his wise words are not completely ignored, they are heeded too late. God smites his wayward people, dooming them to abject defeat in battle and generations of subjugation. The Hebrews repent at length blaming their misfortunes on their own failure to adhere to God's word. They insist to themselves that they could have done better. They rebuild their state, and the cycle begins again. Maybe this vagueness is to serve the point that the Jew stories had a similar repeating pattern. But even with my noobness as far as the Bible stories go, it seemed like this was referring more to one story in particular than others, so I consulted with the one they call Paul. This story jumped out to him as that of the prophet Jeremiah. If you're as clueless as me about particular people in the Bible, here's a quick and dirty version. Jeremiah was chosen by God to tell the people of Jerusalem that their shit was going to go majorly sideways because they'd been cheating on God with Baal. This message was not well received, to put it mildly. His advice was ignored, and things indeed went sideways for the people of Judah. As spoken on to me by Paulosia, Sounds like a Peterson kind of guy to me. A whole host of the book's previous metaphors come to roost in this next part. Peterson says that our lives mirror the early biblical stories. We build structures to live in. Meaning local things like families or more broad things like cities or countries. Personal beliefs are derived from the principles behind those structures. Everything starts out hunky-dory like in Eden. But then, things being okay leads us to becoming complacent. We forget to pay attention. We take what we have for granted. We turn a blind eye. We fail to notice that things are changing or that corruption is taking root. And everything falls apart. Is that the fault of reality, of God? Or do things fall apart because we have not paid sufficient attention? Alrighty. First, weird that a story could have a similar pattern of events to people's lives, almost like the story could be written as a cautionary tale. Second? Okay, yeah. We do tend to pull our beliefs from the local culture and family, and those are probably behind the structures Peterson's talking about. But then what? Oh no, the things are changing, and this is absolutely equivalent to a corruption of my beliefs. This almost sounds like a kid who's having a tantrum because they hate change and things are changing. Although certain religious groups have made that their life's work. With what's coming later in the chapter, this has an interesting implication if you read it in a political context. A person feels happy about their life, so isn't following politics as closely. Then all of a sudden, a bill is passed, oh, like Canadian C-16, or the Supreme Court rules on some type of marriage. I could see how someone who ardently believes in the truth of the Bible would see some of the recent cultural shifts being equivalent to corruption and the world falling apart. Also, it's that same having cake and eating it language here. Reality being made interchangeable with God. But here's the thing. We have some pretty good evidence of 
reality being a thing that exists. God? Nope. And it seems like this is the chapter where the attempts to hide the Judeo-Christian theming kind of start to become half-hearted at best. Finally, things can fall apart even with 100% attention. To go back to a personal example we've talked about on the channel before, when Cleo's kitty Kay got sick, my husband and I noticed. We took her to the vet. We were all involved on this, and maybe we missed a critical period in escalating her treatment, or her kidneys were just done and it was her time to go. In either case, we were 100% paying attention to this, but her situation fell apart. And that's just how life is sometimes. Sometimes things go pear-shaped when you're not paying attention, and sometimes when you are. Peterson says that Hurricane Katrina and the damage done to New Orleans and surrounding areas is an example of willful blindness and corruption taking the city down because it was known that there were faults with the levees and everything that weren't fixed. Fair enough. But then... A hurricane is an act of God, but failure to prepare when the necessity for preparation is well known, that's sin. That's failure to hit the mark, and the wages of sin is death. He continues by saying that the ancient Jews believed that God was axiomatically good, and as a consequence, reality was by default good, and so if things were bad, it was their fault. Peterson calls accepting the blame for everything insanely responsible, and that the alternative of not accepting the blame for everything is going to lead you down the raisin cookie spiral of doom. The alternative is to judge reality as insufficient, to criticize being itself, and to sink into resentment and the desire for revenge. <sighs> a couple things. First, automatically and unquestioningly accepting the blame for everything is incredibly irresponsible, and implying that people should do this is incredibly irresponsible advice. This is the exact state that an abusive, manipulative person would love to find their target in. Second, why is this a dichotomy? Why can't there be a mix of reality and the person being partially responsible when something goes sideways? The alternative to accepting all blame is not the pathway to revenge. How can he believe this? Final thing is a psychological thing called the Just World Phenomenon. Basically, People tend to have an assumption that other people deserve whatever they get, typically in negative contexts. This frequently shows up in victims being blamed for being victims. You never would have gotten assaulted if you weren't dressed that way, or similar ideas. A side effect of this phenomenon is that victims tend to receive less empathy or help. Peterson's train of thought here is a direct, unironic application of the just world belief. If things are going pear-shaped, it's because it's your fault and you deserve it. So by this logic, the people who were directly impacted by Hurricane Katrina deserved what they got because they didn't prepare more. Forget the fact that most of the people who were directly impacted hard by this hurricane weren't the ones responsible for upgrading the levy or how the money was spent. They missed the mark, they sinned, and so they got what was coming to them. So, the cyclical Bible story, things falling apart because we aren't paying enough attention, the wages of sin is death in reference to Hurricane Katrina. Is the logical thread here that you have bad things happen to you because you weren't paying attention? That it's your fault when shit goes sideways? But the alternative to accepting full blame will lead to vengeance cookies? What? How is this helpful advice? If anything, it seems like it would lead to hypervigilant, anxious people always on their guard, trying to attend to everything because if they slip up, just revenge cookies for here on out. He wraps up the section by saying that suffering is normal, but that if you are starting to become corrupted because your suffering is too much, to keep reading. This might just be me, but I don't like the repeated use of corruption here in this context. It's reminding me of the virginity talk that kids, particularly girls, can get in sex ed in some parts. If you aren't familiar, let me ruin that for you. So, in sex ed, in the US, I mean, you may be aware that it's largely abstinence-based. So, keep the kids from having sex at all, don't talk about safe sex, 
get them scared. And part of this, especially for girls, is to tell them that their virginity is like a piece of gum. And every person you sleep with is like another person chewing that gum. And wouldn't it be nice for you to have a nice pristine piece of gum to give your husband on your wedding day instead of a used chewed piece of gum that's just like left on the sidewalk or something. And so this isn't necessarily where Peterson is going with the corruption, but I'm still feeling a parallel here where once you become corrupted, you're always going to be stained by that. And so it's best to avoid that corruption altogether. Consider your circumstances. Start small. Have you taken full advantage of the opportunities offered to you? Are you working hard on your career or even your job? Or are you letting bitterness and resentment hold you back and drag you down? He continues with other examples like family issues or bad habits. The implication I'm getting from this is that if you aren't succeeding in some part of your life, it's your fault. And on one level, sure. If you are refusing opportunities that are coming your way, but still are blaming the world or something for you not succeeding, it would probably benefit you to look at your perspective and those opportunities again. But sometimes you can fail despite working really hard and taking all of these opportunities. It seems like Peterson is flipping the causality here, where instead of a person working really hard and failing and becoming bitter and resentful because of that, he says that a person is bitter and resentful, and that's leading to the failure. However, this is logically consistent with the insanely responsible thing from earlier, where you take 100% responsibility because reality is good by default. Although, now that I think about it a little bit, it's logically inconsistent with some of his advice earlier, where life is just suffering and chaos and you just need to toughen up, bucko. Have you cleaned up your life? There's no if yes portion, so we'll move straight to the if no portion. How does one clean up their life? Stop doing the things you know to be wrong. Yes, 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 yes. Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Ovaltine? But he doesn't stop there. Don't bother questioning if something is wrong or not if you know deep down that it's wrong. Inopportune questioning can confuse without enlightening as well as deflecting you from action. You can know that something is wrong or right without knowing why. Your entire being can tell you something you can neither explain nor articulate. Every person is too complex to know themselves completely and we all contain wisdom that we cannot comprehend. First, let me say that we absolutely have stuff floating around our head that we can't really explain or articulate well. In cognitive psychology, we call these things implicit. And so an example of something that is implicit knowledge that you may have is riding a bicycle. This is learned through motor learning and you can probably do it once you've learned how and it's hard to forget, but trying to teach somebody else how to ride a bicycle is hard. You're having to try to pull up this information that you can't really explain that well and teach it to somebody else. You know, really just throw them on the bike and hope for the best. Uh, so we contrast implicit learning, knowledge, and memory against explicit. So explicit learning, knowledge, and memory are the things that you can explain or have conscious awareness of. So explicit memories would be things like something that happened to you last week or some fact that you just have floating around your head. However, I would be shocked, dare I say even shook, if any cognitive psychologist went in on the collective unconsciousness as being the source for this knowledge. Implicit learning and implicit knowledge by its nature is something that you have to experience for yourself. Even if, especially if you aren't consciously aware of what you're learning. Hey dissertation, what are you doing here? So all that aside, I have a serious problem with this whole quote. The gist I'm getting from it is that the reader needs to not question their beliefs, just roll with them because we can't really understand ourselves, plus questioning yourself and your beliefs would just confuse you. Keep on with whatever beliefs you were likely raised with, whatever they may be, just don't question them. Silly Billy, you'll get confused. Fuck thinking and fuck progress, apparently. 
Peterson continues on about doing and saying the things you can be proud of, not doing or not saying the things you wouldn't be proud of, in many different ways, as is demanded by the style madness. There's a bit of waffling, though. So Peterson says that you can rely on your gut for things, and that you don't have to adhere to some external, arbitrary code of behavior. Before maybe realizing that saying this might cause people to chuck out their Bibles and lose their adherence to the old ways, so he kind of walks back how much you should actually trust your own gut versus the collective wisdom of your ancestors. Then, Angry Peterson returns briefly, Don't blame capitalism, the radical left, or the iniquity of your enemies. Don't reorganize the state until you have ordered your own experience. Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try to rule a city? If it wasn't apparent that he didn't really follow his own advice before now, it should be pretty clear here. His choice of examples for things not to blame is interesting. The inclusion of capitalism is pretty on brand for somebody who rages against postmodern neo-Marxism. You damn kids! Quit killing industries! What did diamonds and department stores ever do to you? But why can't we blame capitalism for some of shit life syndrome? The unequal wealth distribution in the US and around the world isn't the fault of the majority of people. But then the next item on the list is the radical left, which hasn't been referred to at any point before now or even defined. One, it makes it sound like the radical left is some sort of boogeyman that's gonna get ya. Two, as talked about in previous videos in this series, it seems like the target audience for these books are the disenfranchised or disillusioned young men. And I think in general, those guys tend to skew kind of more conservative on the political spectrum. And so in that context, this advice of not blaming the radical left for things in your life, which may be your fault, might not be bad advice. However, taking a step back and combining the capitalism with the radical left, it might be reinforcing this idea that it's best for you to just keep your head down and not really worry with improving the world in any way. Last in this list is the iniquity of your enemies. And so iniquity, for reference, is basically immoral, unfair, or sinful behavior. And my husband brought up an interesting implication or interpretation of this that I hadn't thought of. So sinful or immoral behavior. What group tends to be called sinful or immoral by the religious right? Hmm. On the one hand, there's all that research we talked about in the previous parts for this rule, where perceived control is really important for your ability to cope with negative life events. And so giving up that control to your enemies is counterproductive to that coping. On the other hand, if somebody is getting ahead by cheating, especially at our expense, why can't we call them out on it? Just like how you shouldn't question your beliefs or your morals, you also shouldn't bother with anything outside your immediate sphere of influence until your life is in perfect order. Never mind that that is just a Sisyphean task. Although maybe that's the point. Peterson directs us to say what we really think and what we need, both at home and at work, but advice for how to accommodate others' thoughts and needs is not included. But this is consistent with the rest of the book so far. It hasn't been about being a better friend or improving your parenting skills so that your kids have a happier and healthier childhood and growing up experience. It's about making friends who benefit you and making sure that your kids do things that don't piss you off. It's always written with you, the reader, at the center of the universe. But come on, Peterson, don't you know? We live in a society. In doing this, Somehow, your head will clear because you're not filling it with lies. What exactly these lies are is not clarified here, so maybe it's that inopportune questioning he was talking about earlier? As time continues on with you presumably following these steps, Peterson says that you'll find more subtle things that you're doing wrong, and to stop doing those as well. After some months and years of diligent effort, your life will become simpler and less complicated. Your judgment will improve. You will untangle your past. You will become stronger and less bitter. You will move more confidently into the future. 
You will stop making your life unnecessarily difficult. You will then be left with the inevitable bare tragedies of life, but they will no longer be compounded with bitterness and deceit. These are some pretty bold claims. Claims that would definitely appeal to someone looking to unfuck their life. And maybe it does work that way for some people. Efficacy data would be nice though. And it's also possible that this is sort of a placebo effect. Doing anything to improve your life might just make it better because you're doing something to improve your life. I assume a person's judgment would improve because they're not worrying themselves with figuring out if their beliefs could be changed, possibly for the better. I wonder if it's that last sentence there that really stuck in people's craw when it came out that Peterson was on anti-anxiety meds to help him deal with his wife's cancer. And as I said in a different video, that is a horrible situation and I totally get needing some pharmaceutical help to get through that situation and support your partner. And after all, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones and I'm on anti-anxiety meds to help me with my anxiety. Oh, no, I'm getting ahead myself. It's the next part. Perhaps you will discover that your now less corrupted soul, much stronger than it might have otherwise been, is now able to bear those remaining necessary, minimal, inescapable tragedies. Perhaps you will even learn to encounter them so that they stay tragic, merely tragic, instead of degenerating into outright hellishness. Maybe your anxiety and hopelessness and resentment and anger, however murderous initially, will recede. Perhaps your uncorrupted soul will then see its existence as a genuine good, as something to celebrate, even in the face of your own vulnerability. There's the sore spot. The gist of the argument being that Peterson should have been able to bear the tragedy and hellishness of his wife's cancer by following his own advice. But apparently, Peterson's anxiety didn't recede until the health crisis was over. Also, here's a point where the positive life message tries to happen. Maybe your murderous anger will subside if you follow this advice. Maybe. Never mind that Peterson set up ending oneself as the courageous, strong choice as described by Tolstoy, and especially never mind that Peterson himself took the outward expression of that as totally understandable sometimes even justifiable. Maybe by not questioning your beliefs and doing behaviors you know to be wrong, you'll lose the murderous intent that was otherwise natural. We conclude this chapter with Peterson saying that if everybody could just follow this advice, the world would be a better place. Who knows what existence might be like if we all decided to strive for the best? Who knows what eternal heavens might be established by our spirits, purified by truth, aiming skyward? right here on the fallen earth. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Apparently, purified by truth means not corrupting your beliefs with any sort of introspection. Know thyself not, got it. Imagine a world where no one questions the beliefs they were inculcated with as children. Doesn't sound like heaven to me. So, this was Peterson's take on the whole glass house is saying, but taken to a weird conclusion. I'm still unclear on how the majority of this chapter actually rectifies the stupidity of the joke being played on us by life. We ended part one with Peterson asking how a person who is awake can avoid outrage at the world. Apparently, it's through blind obedience to whatever beliefs you may have and to not do bad things. Brilliant. Give this man a Nobel Prize. While rehashing the takeaways from this chapter from the beginning, let's also go through the alternatives to Peterson's life advice. If you're having trouble in some way in your life, don't just throw your hands in the air and give up. But especially don't start stoking the vengeance fires. As Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. If your situation is particularly bleak or hard, they may be harder to find, but they are there. If nothing else, this random person on the internet wants your life to improve, wants you to find happiness even. And there may be some hard life truths you have to face in the process, but you can grow from them. Your life doesn't have to be shit forever. The world can be hard and cruel. 
there's no point in sugarcoating that. But instead of trying to contain your rage and your vengeance, how about spreading some positivity? It can be a thankless job, but just knowing that you brighten somebody else's day can make your day a little bit brighter too. Sometimes bad things happening to you are your fault, and sometimes it's just life and there's nothing you could have done differently. The research we talked about in part one and part two does seem to indicate that it's important for you to take ownership and responsibility for your part of that bad thing happening and then figuring out how to deal with it. You are in control of yourself for yourself. Exercising mindfulness of what's going on in yourself and in your life is important. Check in with what's going on and how you're doing. But don't take more responsibility for blame than is fair. I would think it would go without saying, but since we're here, if you know an action is wrong, don't do it. I would also say that questioning yourself and your beliefs from time to time is a healthy thing to do. Maybe you came across a challenging piece of information or a perspective that's different from yours. Don't just ignore these things because they might confuse you. You almost certainly can't know all the nitty gritty hidden aspects of your cognition, but you can know yourself, your beliefs, your preferences, your needs, and you should. Figuring out and maintaining your personal boundaries is important. I won't promise that life will be easier or that you'll be more confident, but practicing empathy and kindness for others and yourself will go a long way in preventing your life from being unnecessarily difficult. Thankfully, that's it for this chapter. Next week, we will be finishing off the first patron poll topic winner by swimming in the shallow end of the incredibly deep topic that is psychiatry. Want to vote on future polls? Hit up my Patreon. All right, see you next week. Bye.